Um, now, in the interest of full disclosure, J.S. Lint comes with a warning. The warning is, J.S. Lint will hurt your feelings. <laughs> and it's true. I hear from people all the time, well, J.S. Lint hurt my feelings. You know, can you make it stop? You know, and I hear it all the time. And I understand the pain, because um, sometimes someone will show me a, a, a case where there is an error that J.S. Lint could have detected. So I go, OK, great. So I put the rule into the program. And then I run all my old programs through it. And boom, I get stung on it. And oh, it hurts. And you know, I, I understand that pain. Um, but um, th the complaints keep coming. Well, I, I should be able to do this. And, you know, and, it, and after a few years of this, I start wondering, well, wait a minute. This is a code quality tool. And it promises that if you put your program in it, it will tell you how to make your program better. And it does. And they run the program and put their program in it, knowing that that's what it'll do. And when it does it, they cry. And I'm going, well, why is this? I mean, it seems to be a disconnect here. It's doing exactly what they wanted it to do, or they wouldn't have run it in the first place. So where is this coming from? Um, and you know, it reminds me of the sorts of debates and arguments programmers will have, where we get really upset about things which appear to be completely trivial and, and ridiculous. For example, where do you put the curly brace? <laughs> Do you put the curly brace on the left or on the right? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, just the right, right? And just the left. So um, uh, when Ken Thompson was designing the B language, which was his variation on BCPL, which was an elegant little language, and B turned into an, an elegant little language, too. Um, he had to decide what, where to put the curly brace. And he decided to put it on the right, because it just seemed to make sense. And when Dennis Ritchie uh, did C by basically putting a Pascal type system onto B, um, he did the same thing. He tended to put them on the right. Not a good reason to prefer one or the other. There's really no good reason. Um, but it's sort of like. Um, there's not a good reason for why we drive on the left or on the right. You know, that you know, people in Japan and England don't appear to have better or worse accident rates than people in other places. Um, now, you can ask people in those, you know, which is better, and they'll say, well, you can, the gear shift is easier, or it's easier to crank the window or something, but ultimately that doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's silly. So it doesn't matter if we drive on the left or the right, but there's a good reason for why we all drive on the same side. <laughs> now, so we're sort of lucky that there's not a bridge between here and England because you know, it, it just doesn't come up. Um, and curly braces are the same. Um, you know, while you can't get people to agree on is it left or right, you can agree on things like you should always be consistent. You don't want to put them on the left sometimes and on the right other times because it just looks stupid. And we're trying hard not to intentionally look stupid. Um, and you can get everybody to agree that however you do it, everyone else should be doing it the way you're doing it, because you wouldn't be doing it the way you're doing it if you weren't right. Um, and so the rest of them are wrong for some reason. We don't know why that is, but, but they are. So I'm sure at Bell Labs, um, they had a meeting. Because there were guys in um, what became the Unix lab who wanted to put it on the left. You know, so they probably got around a table and they argued, and the arguments are stupid because there's not a good reason one way or the other. And after a few hours of that, I'm sure Thompson said, enough, I don't care. Um, so he could have solved this problem at that point just by saying, it's on the right, damn it, and that's just the way it is. You know, he could have put it in the compiler and said, argument over, but he didn't. Uh, and as a consequence, who knows how many man centuries we have wasted. <laughs> is it on the left or on the right? You know, so if you have someone who's used to putting it on the left, and he goes to work for a shop that puts him on the right, and they say, OK, so now that you're here, you've got to put him on the right, he's going to start to cry. So no, I don't want to put him on the left. And he'll start coming up with all the reasons for why it's so much better to put him on the left. And the arguments don't make any sense, because there's not a good reason. Um, and that just, and he's, if he can hear himself saying these things, he may even be aware of it. And that just makes him cry more. And, and he's saying, I w this wouldn't be important if 
you know, if I weren't crying, you know, there's, there's, there's a reason for why I'm getting so upset, you know, and there's this righteous anger that's going on, but there's absolutely no truth or evidence to support it. And as programmers, we do this crap all the time. Uh, we argue about all kinds of stuff, and when normal people hear us arguing about that, it's like, what? You're arguing about where the punctuation goes? Seriously? Because that's all, it's just punctuation. Let's go there, there, and how, just, we're gonna put it on the right. Go, okay, right, okay. You know, why isn't that easy? So ultimately, I don't know what the right answer is because there's not a good reason, except in JavaScript. It turns out in JavaScript, there is a right answer, which is to always put it on the right and never put it on the left. And here is why. It's because um, of the return statement. We, something that we do a lot in JavaScript is return a new object from a function, and this is how you do it. You've got the object literal, which is one of the good parts in JavaScript, and you want to return it. And if you put the curly brace on the right, it does exactly the right thing, which is exactly what you would expect. But if you put the curly brace on the left, there is this stupid, stupid thing in JavaScript called automatic semicolon insertion, which will, in fact, stick a semicolon right after the return statement. Um, and this particular object literal is not going to trigger any kind of syntax error. So the code's just going to go right on through. And when it fails, um, because of that semicolon, it's going to return undefined instead of the new object. Your program's not going to fail at this, at this point. It's going to fail sometime downstream. Uh, when you try to get something from that object and you get um, an error instead, a, a type error probably. And at that point you go, okay, boom, and you start backtracking through the debugger, and who knows how long it's gonna take you to get back to this statement, and you're looking at this statement, and you go, well, that looks right. It, where'd the object go? And then you're gonna track back forward the other way. This is gonna be a really painful time-wasting exercise, which could have been completely avoided if you put the curly brace on the right. If you put the curly brace on the right, you will never experience that pain. Now what's the, you know, let's look at this as a trade-off. What's the difference in cost of putting the curly brace on the left or the right? There's, there's no cost, free, okay? What's the benefit? You're going to avoid the wastage of hours of your life on this stupid design error that was in JavaScript. That should be an easy trade-off, right? For no cost, I can avoid pain. You know, and there's no benefit to doing it the other way. It's a great trade-off. So that's the way we should do it. And this should, should not be controversial. It should be just, it's easy. We should want to prefer forms that are error resistant because uh, errors are what cost us time. JavaScript has a switch statement, which was also modeled after Thompson's switch statement, which unfortunately was modeled on the Fortran compute go to statement. Now Dijkstra correctly observed that um, go to's are harmful and so they've been removed from all modern programming languages, except that they still exist in the switch statement in the form of fall through. Um, someone once wrote me while I was developing JS Lint and said, you should be checking for this fall through case because it's something that's very easy to miss when you're reading the code and can be therefore quite difficult to diagnose and debug. And I thought about it deeply and then I wrote back to him, um, there's this really elegant thing that happens when you get all the cases to line up and they cascade through and go one into another. And it's so elegant and, and marvelous. And, you know, and the fall through thing, yeah, that happens, but it, it hardly ever happens. Um, and the elegance just outweighs it. You know, so weighting the risk versus the elegance, I, I would call this a good trade-off. So I'm, I'm not gonna give the warning, okay. So the next day, the same guy writes to me, he says, oh, I found a bug in JS Lint. Great, so I throw in the debugger. Yeah, you know where this is going, right? I had a case that was falling through. And in that moment, I achieved enlightenment. <laughs> we imagine we spend most of our time power typing. I'm writing a program, ta 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 uh, But we don't. We spend most of our time making mistakes and correcting them. Um, and the process of correcting mistakes is really painful. Um, and we'll go through and, and do all that awful stuff and eventually we'll figure it out and we'll fix it and we get this little rush of euphoria. Wow, that you know, feels good. And in that rush, we kind of black out all of that 
lost time. And so we tend to not be aware of how much time we spend in fixing our bugs, and we also tend to not learn from our mistakes. But on this particular occasion, it was so humiliating because I had just given a speech about how this was a good feature and had undeniable evidence, in fact, that it wasn't, that I could not avoid, on this instance, learning from that mistake. And the thing that I figured out was, if I never intentionally fall through, then I can find the cases where I accidentally fall through. That turns out to be a good trade-off. Um, so what was my mistake? So I, I made a couple of mistakes. One was I said there was elegance in that cascading fall-through pattern. That was wrong. Um, there's no, nothing there. What, it, what actually happens is you have um, coincidental coupling while you're uh, arbitrarily trying to push things together which are uh, coincidentally similar but, but not so. So you're actually, in some cases, creating cruft as a result of doing that. And so I'm, I was actually making programs worse in order to do this little thing that I thought was elegant. But there was a more fundamental error. That was, I said, that hardly ever happens which is the way the gut says it happens. Because the gut's really bad at math. You know, so uh, not very much is indistinguishable from nothing. Um, it gets other things wrong too, like uh, most is given more weight than all. It's just really bad at math. Um, and it manages to control much more of our programming experience than we would ever imagine. Um, so I found that a good style can help produce better programs. Um, and style is important. So it shouldn't be about personal preference or self-expression. You know, you don't try to show you're an artist in your code. You should be trying to show that your code works and is dependable. Um, and so the, we should be producing a style which is intended not to reduce keystrokes, but to reduce errors, because that turns out to be the better trade-off. So there's some hints we can get about programming style from literary style. The Romans wrote Latin all in uppercase with no word breaks or punctuation. They were, they were able to read this stuff. Um, you know, you get used to it. Um, and it made sense to them. Um, and, and this worked, even though there are potential ambiguities. For example, you could read the third line as, now or DB reeks. Um, but usually you get it right, but you know, you could get it wrong, but that hardly ever happens. Um, so this worked pretty good until Constantine established Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire. And at this point, it becomes necessary to make copies of all the holy documents and distribute them around the world. The problem was they didn't have the originals of any of the documents. All they had were copies of copies of copies of copies and none of the copies agreed with each other. And this was a problem for an institution that was claiming its divine right based on the word, and nobody was sure exactly what the word was. Um, so that was the state of the art um, until the Middle Ages when medieval copyists introduced lowercase word breaks and punctuation. These innovations helped to reduce the error rates. This made it easier to copy the manuscripts without introducing new errors. Also, uh, coincidentally, it also made the um, books easier to read, which turned out to be a useful thing because it was, um, and these, con so when Gutenberg started printing, he copied these conventions. We've been using these conventions for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and they work. We still use them today. We use them all the time. All of us have been trained our whole lives to use these conventions, um, and they work. They've been proven. We've been educated to use them, and they're very effective. Um, so the thing that those monks found was that good use of style can help reduce the occurrence of errors. Um, and that is a useful thing. Um, there have been lots of uh, excellent books written about literary style. One of my favorites is William Strunk's The Elements of Style. Um, he wrote it over 100 years ago, and English has continued to evolve since then. So some of his advice is a little dated, but a lot of his advice is really, really good. And there have been um, programmers who have read his book and said, we can apply this to programming. So there are Schneiderman's The Elements of Fortran Style and uh, Kernighan and Plauger's uh, Elements of Programming Style, which is one of the best computer books ever written. 
Um, so programs must communicate clearly to people. Uh, some people would hold that all that matters is does the compiler understand it? And if it does, that's enough. Um, but um, that's not true, that we need to be able to understand our own programs, particularly if we're working in teams or, uh, or if we're working with programs that are going to have enough longevity that other people are going to be expected to use them, or if we're going to open them and, and make them available to a larger community, it's vitally important that the code be understandable. So we should be using the elements of good composition where applicable in our programs because we, we have a lot of evidence that um, they work. So if you have commas in your program, you should put a space after the comma, not in front of the comma. You shouldn't leave the comma out because that's the way you do it in literary style. It makes sense to follow the same conventions there. Um, you know, a, a, a novelist who's trying to impress people with how good a writer he is would not put his periods at the beginning of his sentences instead of the end to show that he's so awesomely creative. You know, you know, his reader's not going to go and look at that. Wow, look at his masterful use of punctuation. This, <laughs> this guy really knows how to write. No, you're going to look at him and say, this guy's illiterate. What, what's the matter? He can't get his punctuation right. That a good writer will slavishly obey the rules of style. He'll, get all the, he'll capitalize the right things. He'll put the periods in the right things. The way he expresses his creativity is in his choice of words and in the structures and the stories that he tells. Um, there's plenty of creative space there um, without having to, to muck around with the punctuation. Now, in, in programming, we require much more precision than, than is required in English. Um, and some of the conventions we've adopted in our languages are ambiguous. For example, we use parentheses to do all kinds of things. Um, so I recommend um, not putting spaces in places where we are talking about the name of a function in order to declare it or um, invoke it. Uh, but in all other places, we do have the space. And that's to help disambiguate and make the program easier to read and easier to understand. And you could say, well, I should be able to write thing. I, I should be able to put a space after foo. Uh, people can figure it out. But you don't want people to be figuring it out. You don't want them to be proofreading your stuff while they're trying to understand it. You want to get all that stuff out of the way so they can focus all of their mental energy on understanding what the program does and how it works. Um, one of the, the good parts in JavaScript is the immediately invocable function expression. Um, this allows us to um, have some code which is kept out of the global space. You know, global variables are one of the big hazards in JavaScript, and we, we don't want them. Um, so this provides us a way of having modularity within the language. And currently, it's the only way we accomplish modularity. In the next edition, we'll have a real module. But until then, this is the way we do it. Unfortunately, there is an ambiguity in the syntax of the language that um, if the word function appears in statement position, it cannot be invoked immediately. It's treated as an expression rather than a, or as a statement rather than as an expression. So people figured out that you could get around that design error in the language by wrapping the, parenthesis, the uh, function in parentheses. Um, but I think this is missing something. Because the thing I want to impress on the reader of the program is that the important thing isn't the function. The important thing is the invocation. So wrapping the function in parens doesn't communicate anything useful to the reader. And then you've got the extra invoking things sitting out there like a pair of dog balls. <laughs> uh, ladies, you may want to look away. Um, so I, I think it would at least be neater to move that parent out one character so that um, it encloses the whole thing. It, it's all nice and neat. And because the thing I want to communicate to the reader is what's important here is the whole expression. And the whole expression includes the invocation. 